effective knowledge that you can that you are prepared to communicate to someone else. So knowing all this stuff yourself, that's step one. Step two is being prepared to communicate that stuff. To communicate your knowledge, to communicate your expertise. And number three, you have to effectively tell others what you are talking about. Effectively communicate to others. And that's it. That is to me. That's all there is to it. Every skill that you learn, every argument that you learn, every card that you cut, every source that you consult, every exercise that you do at Summer Debate Institute is a way to enhance your ability in one or more of these areas. You've got to know stuff. You've got to know what you're talking about. You have to prepare to communicate that knowledge to an audience, the audience being the judge. And you have to be effective at communicating. Then excellence is just ahead. Isn't that a nice picture? I like that picture. Cool road, sorry. Cool road, sorry. Number three, our third part of this. Three guiding principles. So because that's what debate is about, because that's how you get better at debate, I think that the job of Summer Debate Institute is to help you better know what you're talking about. It's a big part. I think it's to help you better prepare to talk about what you know. And I think it's to train you so that when you are talking about what you know, you are good at talking about it. Specifically, number one, Summer Debate Institute is an opportunity to gain topic expertise. To gain topic expertise. This is your chance to learn a lot about Cuba, about Mexico, about Venezuela, about economic engagement, about Latin America, about American politics as they relate to Latin America, about international relations theory, about the role of China and Russia and Iran, etc. in Latin America about oil and energy, about human rights and democracy promotion, about free trade. It's your chance to become an expert in the subject matter of this year's topic. And I encourage you to do that at Summer Institute because that's really hard to do during the school year. It's really hard to do when you get back home. You'll have files to cut for your first tournament. You'll have homework to do. If you're an older student, you'll have college applications to write. You've got friends that you want to hang out with. And so while you will have time to do debate work, you will not have time to do a lot of background reading. You will not have time to do a lot of in-depth research about just basic concepts about the topic. So this is your chance to go home an expert so that all the research you do at home, all the assignments you complete at home, all of the affirmatives that you write or the disadvantages that you write or the updates that you research, all that stuff is grounded in some expertise about the topic. And Michigan State is a great choice for learning a lot about the topic. I think we do that well here. Number two, Summer Debate Institute is an opportunity to learn how to research and prepare. It's an opportunity to learn how to research and prepare. Certainly a big part of that is researching and preparing. So researching to do your assignments at camp, you know, preparing your materials to get ready for practice debates and to get ready for the mini tournaments and stuff like that. But that's not enough. It's not enough to just prepare and to research. You have to learn how to get better at those things. You have to become a better researcher. You have to become a better file preparer. You've got to get better at highlighting evidence, about being more efficient, about being more organized, about managing your time better. Your instructors and the RAs and the other people that kind of hang out at, at the camp to help you out, the people that will be judging your debates, the people that will be checking in with you in the dorms, they have a lot of experience. And you should draw upon that to not just do research and preparation, but to improve research and preparation. Your goal should be to be a better researcher, a better preparer when you get home in the fall so that you have more time to cut cards, so that you have more time to do your homework, to hang out with your friends, to do other things. So don't just use Summer Institute as a platform to do research and to do prep, but really learn how to get better at it. Number three, last one. Summer Debate Institute is an opportunity to practice skills. Practice skills. 
I picked some photos from last year's SDI. I don't know if you can see this. It's kind of blurry. That's, that's Will Repco, be one of your instructors. That's He-Man Sanjeev, uh, who last year as a junior won the Baker Award, which is the award for the best team in the country. Uh, he won top speaker at a million tournaments, the first of which during last year was the SDI tournament. That's Steven Karthikeyan from Chattahoochee, uh, who was one of the best debaters in the country. That's Yo-Yo from Berkeley Prep in Florida, another one of the best debaters in the country. Zach Burdett is back there, Kieran Green, I can't tell the person in the far right is from here. Uh, but all of these students during the summer last year really made it a point to get better at skills. They really did it, made a point to practice the things they weren't good at and to get better at those things and to eliminate weaknesses and to, to really strive to improve, not just to solidify skills they already have, but they put themselves out there and they try to get better. They try to eliminate the, the parts of their debate game that made them vulnerable, that made them weaker. And I think they did a good job of that. And the way they did that is they practiced the process. They practiced the process. They practiced all of the component parts of debating, all of the, the different micro skills and micro abilities that a debater needs. And the reason they used Summer Institute to do that is that when they got back to uh, their, their schools in the fall, they couldn't do that. They wanted to win the important debates. They wanted to win the debates at at big tournaments. And when you're at a tournament, you just gotta you know, do your best and try to win the debate. But when you're at Summer Institute, you don't have to care that you have won the practice debate. You have to care whether you have improved in the practice debate. And if you have improved in the practice debate, then you have won the practice debate. So most practice debates at Summer Institute should be double wins. Because all four students that are participating in the debate and any students that are watching the debate should be learning and should be improving. Your goal is not to win the practice debate. That's not even a thing. There is no winner. Your goal is to get better. That's what winning uh, in practice debates is. That's what winning at skills drills is. That's when you do a speaking drill, when you do a research assignment, when you do a rebuttal rework, when you do a mini debate about topicality or mini debate about conditionality or whatever. You, to win that activity means to get better at that skill, to get better at that process, to not think about Summer Institute as competitive, but as cooperative. You're using one another as a resource to improve yourself. You're helping others learn, and by helping others learn, you yourself are learning. The other thing that they did is they tried to simulate game conditions. They tried to do the things that it took during the summer to simulate what it will be like in the fall. That means taking practice debates seriously. It means arranging the practice debates so that they're maximally useful. <laughs> So they didn't exploit disparities in the evidence set. They didn't find the argument that there wasn't an answer to yet and then just read that argument so the other team couldn't respond. They didn't mess with disclosure to try to trick the other team so the other team wouldn't be prepared for the debate, so the other team wouldn't be debating their best. They encouraged the other team to debate their best because it was only when the opponent, which I would call in Summer Institute, not your opponent, but your sort of partner, only when that other team was was their best, could the student learn the most? So you want good debates, you want competitive debates, you want debates where you're debating your best, the other team that you're working with is debating their best, instructors are providing the best feedback, you're learning the most possible. A couple role models for you all. All right. That's the short version of how to succeed in debate camp. So first thing I want to talk about very easy. I do encourage you to watch the whole thing. If that piqued your interest, watch the whole thing. So it's a little weird to call this the Latin America topic, because here's Latin America. It's the green, I think it's green. It's green on my screen. Green for y'all, I guess it's just dark for y'all. That's Latin America. A little weird to call this the Latin America topic. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but that's the part of the world. I encourage you if you got a computer and you got the internet, you know, pull up Google Maps, just type in like Venezuela or something and zoom out, and just kind of you know feel get a feel for Latin America. Here's the resolution: the United States federal government should substantially increase economic engagement for Cuba, Mexico, and Venezuela. That's not that hard. That's pretty simple, right? I got different colors going on here kind of divide it up into important parts. 
We're going to talk about some of those parts. We're not going to talk about other of those parts. But I would, I would just kind of get a feel for the different parts. So we got the United States Federal Government should. That's how almost every resolution starts. We got substantially increased. That's we got to know some stuff about that. We got to figure out what that means. What that means for topicality. What that means for negative, negative strategies. We got its. That word just kind of hanging out there. That might be important. Its economic engagement. And okay, we got to figure out what that means. That's important. That one's that maybe the most important. And there's this other important one. Toward. What the heck does that mean? It's over there, you know, purple or pink or whatever. Color. It's a different one, too. And then we got the three countries, two and Mexico, and Venezuela. Man. I got a lot of questions about this. Lots of questions. So, by this point, it's like, what time is it? It's 9.34. Some of you are already tuning out. Like, oh, dear. What did I sign up for? This is boring. This is the part where you're going to just drone on and tell me a bunch of stuff that I don't care about. I'm going to go to Snapchat. Snapchat. I'm going to chat some Let me check my timeline. Let's see who's tweeting at 9.30 in the morning on a Monday. Let me, let me post some pictures on Facebook. Let's, let me G-chat my friends. A bunch of you right now are G-chatting one another. You're like, he's not very funny. <laughs> That's not funny. Okay, listen, he's trying again. He's still trying to be funny. He's failing. I'm a loser. <laughs> There's at least three of those conversations occurring. And I get it, right? I've been to my share of opening topic lectures. And a bunch of them, I was tired. You know, I got in late last night. I know a lot of you traveled yesterday. If you're on the West Coast, this is horrible. It's like, what is it, like 3 in the morning for you all? It's awful, right? You're used to waking up at 10 your time. You're waking up at, like, some god-awful time. I'm sure it's terrible. I, I, I sympathize, right? Sometimes these are boring. I'm going to try not to make this boring. So give me a chance. If you are going to multitask, if you, if you just, if I'm terrible, which is fair, you know, if, I'm, if you think I'm terrible, then I'm just not doing my job. That's on me, not on you. Try to multitask productively. Try to go over to Wikipedia and read about Venezuela, or read about Cuba, or read about the embargo, or read about Mexico. You know, I might say something that's like, oh, that sounds a little more interesting than the rest of the stuff he's talking about. You know, click over to Wikipedia and read about that. Or whatever. But I'm going to do my best to keep your attention. But if I can't, you know, that's my fault, not your fault. But I do suggest that you give me a chance. I think this will be a little different than what you're used to or what you might think this is going to be. Big questions. So a lot of times topic lectures are like, here's a bunch of stuff that I know. You should know it too. OK? And I do know way more than you about the topic. I know a lot about the topic. I, that's like, <clears throat> I, I care a lot about learning about the topic because I think that's important. And I have the benefit that I just did three weeks of Summer Debate Institute at Georgetown with some of the best debaters in the country. And so they've really challenged me to know a lot. So it's not that I'm better than you, that I know a lot. It's just I've, I've spent more time learning about the topic than you have. And I do have things that I want you to know. But I don't think that just telling you a bunch of stuff that I know is the best way to get you thinking about the topic. And I don't think it's that effective, right? I've, I've been to enough classes where I had teachers, and they were just like, all right, open your notebook, Roman numeral one, blah. Open <laughs> A, blah. Please note the following seven historical facts, right? Some of that stuff is super important. <laughs> And I'm going to talk a little bit about how I want you to listen to the, the specific country lectures, because you're going to get those. <clears throat> you're going to get one about Mexico today, and you're going to get one about Cuba, and one about Venezuela tomorrow. And I'm fascinated by all these countries, and I'm fascinated by their histories, and I think that it is riveting, uh, and that it's super relevant to the topic, <clears throat> super relevant to your debate. I'm going to make a pitch about how I want you to listen to those lectures in a little while. But the format of this lecture will be to ask some big questions about the topic, some of the questions that I had when I first started thinking about this topic several months ago, uh, and that I think are important to think about and that shape the arguments that are going to be made in the debate. So there's going to be five of those big questions. At the end, I got a little, little uh, treat, which is I got the five things, the five most important things that I have learned about the topic while at Georgetown. So I've done three weeks on this topic, and I'm going to share the five things that I think are the biggest things that I know now that I did not know three weeks ago uh, today when I did the opening lecture at Georgetown. <laughs> so big question, the student's asking a question. This is Noah Getz from the St. Mark's School, and Noah Getz holds the, I think, unbreakable record of having worked with me, not just at the camp with me, but in my lab for a total of 18 weeks during his high school career. 
almost all of which was at the SDI. So before his sophomore year, he came to the SDI in a four-week lab with me. Before his junior and senior years, he went to the Hoya Spartan Scholars Program for seven weeks, three weeks each time at Georgetown, four weeks at the SDI. And it's weird not to have him here this year. I've, you know, Noah's one of my favorite students of all time, and I saw this picture of him asking a question. He was very inquisitive, was very thoughtful, and so I was like, this is the perfect picture to introduce this. And so, if you ever see Noah gets judging you, or if any of you are from the St. Mark's School of Texas, you already know Noah, you know, make sure that he knows that he was immortalized in uh, this lecture. I miss him. <laughs> Big question number one. So the first thing I always ask is, why are we debating this topic and not some other topic? I think that's the first question you should always ask when you're starting a new topic. And so those of you that are not seniors, you're going to do this again next year. We don't know what the topic is yet. But I think the first thing to figure out is why we're debating this topic. And the reason that's important is because the reason we're debating the topic shapes the arguments that we will be debating. And so if you can figure out why this is the topic instead of something else, we could be debating gun control, or we could be debating U.S. policy toward Asia, or we could be debating tax policy, or we could be, I mean, Anything. We could be debating NCAA sports regulation. Lots of interesting things, lots of timely things, but we're debating this. We're debating what is called the Latin American topic. We're going to get to that in a minute. Mm. I'm telling you, this water is wonderful. So the organization that selects the topic is, is a little obscure. <clears throat> I know some of you know it because some of you read George Sense. I'm not going to do the like, does anyone know? And then we'll, we'll play that game. I think Alan from Blake got it last time. Is that right? He, he like cheated somehow. He knew. Uh, the National Federation of High Schools is where the topic comes from. I think that's, it's important to know this. You don't have to memorize this or anything. But it's not. It's an organization that's not a debate organization. It's an organization that has a debate component, and it's basically the only debate component is to set the topic. It's not the National Debate Coaches Association. It's not the National Forensic League. It's not you know, the college coaches, the National Debate Tournament or the Cross-Examination Debate Association. It's not any of that. It's not, I don't know, I'm trying to think of some other organization. It's not the National Catholic Forensic League. It's not Michigan State University. It's not the SDI. It's not Georgetown. It's not the Georgetown Debate Seminar, or whatever. It is the National Federation of High School. And when selecting the topic, the National Federation of High Schools uh, has a formal list of criteria. And I, I really like this list. I just, I, I didn't know about this list. I knew about some of these things, but I found the like, formal list of criteria for the topic, and I want to share some of them with you. And I want you to think as we go through this lecture and as you debate during the Summer Institute, you know, is this a good topic? Did they make the right choice in selecting this year's topic uh, based on these criteria? So one thing that the topic's got to be is it's got to be timely. So it has to be relevant to us. It's got to be a policy question that matters in the current time. It's not an old or tired topic. But it can't be so timely that it changes all the time so much that it's really hard to debate. It has to be debatable for a wide range of students. So it's got to be debatable for novices without any debate experience, without a lot of background knowledge. And it has to be good uh, for high-level debates of really experienced students. That's tough. It's hard to find a topic that fits both of those things. It's got to be a topic that can sustain a whole year of debates. You know, we only have one topic a year. Lincoln Douglas debate, they do it every couple months. Public forum changes every month. You know, parliamentary debate changes every round or every tournament or whatever. So it's got to be a topic that can sustain a whole year's worth of debates, keeping it interesting, stopping it from being real repetitive. There's got to be a balance of affirmative and negative ground. That seems obvious, right? Both sides need to have a chance. So the way it works is that authors, anyone, can author a topic paper. And a topic paper is like a proposal for debating this topic. And this year's topic paper was called Latin America, which is why we call this the Latin America topic, but that might be problematic. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And it was written by the coach at St. Andrew's Episcopal in Mississippi. Do we have any Mississippians in here? We didn't have any in Georgia now. No Mississippians? Too bad. I like this. Why? I like I like Ole Miss. It's beautiful. If you're ever in Oxford, Mississippi, if you're ever like close, just drive through Oxford, Mississippi. You can see Faulkner's house. It's beautiful. They have this gorgeous grove with these beautiful trees and this beautiful architecture. It's like paradise. Everyone's like Mississippi sucks, and I'm like, have you ever been to Oxford? And usually they say no. I'm not saying everything about Mississippi is great, but if you ever get a chance to go to Oxford, Mississippi, it's beautiful. 
So in the topic paper, the coach at St. Andrews Episcopal made several arguments for why this should be the topic. And I think it's important to understand this because this motivates a lot of affirmatives. This, this kind of sets up what, what negative ground is going to be. It kind of gives you a sense of what the controversy is. So his first argument is that Latin America has not been debated recently. And he was not exaggerating. The last time that Latin America was debated in high school was 1987 to 1988. Okay? That's a really long time ago. Right? None of you were born then. None of the students, obviously. Some of the coaches were born. And that topic was resolved that the United States government should adopt a policy to increase political stability in Latin America. And in the late 80s, that was a timely topic, political stability in Latin America. The United States had engaged in a series of foreign policies that almost universally agreed upon undermined countries in Latin America. So there's a lot of stuff going on in Nicaragua, and there was a lot of stuff going on in a bunch of other countries. Colombia, Venezuela, even Mexico. A lot of the debates about this year's topic, so fast forwarding a bunch of years later, kind of are rooted in that conversation that was happening in the late 1980s about America's role in Latin America. So this is a chance for you all to update that discussion, to return to a discussion that we haven't had in high school in a long time. College has not debated this really ever. It was discussed a little bit in 1982 and 1983. That was the year I was born. Uh, where they talked about military intervention in the Western Hemisphere. And then it was debated a little bit in 1999 and 2000 when uh, there was a constructive engagement topic, and one of the countries was Cuba, but the other ones were not in Latin America. So was, they debated Cuba once. But not really ever Mexico, not really ever Venezuela. So the first argument is it's timely, and it's been time. We're due. Number two is that Latin America is in a time of transition. I think that's true. Latin America is in a time of transition. Latin America is transitioning from the place that we were debating about in the late 80s as kind of a proxy battlefield for the Cold War, when the Soviet Union and the United States were competing for influence in Latin America. It's, it's changing. It's not so much a proxy place anymore, but it's, it's a regional power. There are regional powers in Latin America. Latin America as a region is gaining more power more influence, more autonomy. There are still battles for influence between the United States and Russia and China, but Latin America has changed a lot, and it's in the process of changing a lot. Number three is that Latin America is growing apart from the United States. Like I said, China has massively expanded its influence in Latin America. Russia expanding its influence. Japan, arguably Iran, other countries. It used to be that a lot of people would write about Latin America and they would describe it, and this is true of Joe Biden and uh, you know, the president of Venezuela, and Nicolas Maduro, I took a lot of offense to this, but Americans like to describe Latin America as their backyard, the United States' backyard. If you're from Latin America, you probably don't like that. But for a long time, it was, it was true in the sense that the United States had a lot of influence in Latin America, and that was kind of considered the United States' domain. And it's changing. Number four, Latin American economies are becoming much more important. A lot of them, Brazil, growing a lot faster than average. A lot faster than the economies in other parts of the world. And that's creating a lot of new opportunities, and that's creating a lot of new challenges. The president of the World, uh, the, uh, world Trade Organization, Latin America. The Pope. The Pope is from Latin America. What is, the last point is Latin American economies are growing, and that's a pretty challenge. Latin America is a bigger player than it used to be. So it makes sense to debate it. And number five, socialist and left-leaning, maybe not quite socialist, but pink governments, not red, but pink governments in Latin America, a lot of them are undergoing transitions. And we're at the point where some of them are going to kind of push all in on socialism. Some of the countries are moving left. Some of the socialist countries are moving right. Cuba is starting to introduce some private property and some privatization, some free market kind of capitalist instruments into its economy. 
Venezuela, after the death of Chavez, is now forced with citing the arc of its economy. But other countries like Bolivia, Nicaragua, Ecuador, a lot of the kind of pink countries in Latin America are at points where they will either solidify their kind of socialist economies or they're going to pursue more capitalism. And what uh, the topic paper didn't really say, but which is true, is that Latin America is back on the agenda. It's something that is being talked about a lot. Since 2009, President Obama, uh, who, by the way, gave a speech at Georgetown when we were there. That was awesome. Uh, has traveled to Latin America six times. And Vice President Biden has traveled there four times. And that's after a long period where the president and the vice president didn't give very much attention to Latin America. That was certainly true during the Bush administration. And a lot of people thought when Obama was elected that that would change. And it didn't really change. But lately, the Obama administration is starting to recognize that they need to get their act together on Latin America. Over the past three weeks, Latin America has blown up. And a lot of people are paying way more attention to Latin America. I hope you all know what that reason is. I'm not going to ask. Uh, but it's Edward Snowden. How many of you honestly don't have any idea who I'm talking about? That's really going to sadden me. Oh, God. Okay. Edward Snowden is the person who either is a traitor or a whistleblower, depending on what you think. 55% of Americans would describe him as a whistleblower. 35% of Americans in the most recent poll have described him as a traitor. He leaked NSA documents to a reporter called named Glenn Greenwald. He's a former debater from Nova High School in Florida who writes for a newspaper, a global, an international newspaper. And he leaked the story about American illegal surveillance of people. And he is holed up in the transit part of the Russian airport seeking asylum. And the countries that have come to his rescue are countries in Latin America. Venezuela has offered him asylum. Bolivia has offered him asylum. Nicaragua has offered him asylum. Uh, and Ecuador uh, and a couple of other countries have kind of talked about it, but his best shot at this point is probably to end up in Venezuela. And so there's been a lot of talk about Latin America. And like, why is Venezuela offering this person asylum? Why is Bolivia so angry? There was an incident when the Bolivian president's plane was grounded. And uh, the next day, while we were at Georgetown, the, the kind of pink governments of Latin America held a summit. And they, they were very angry. And they called it a violation of international law. And you're going to learn a lot about Snowden this summer. But it's super timely. Real policymakers, real politicians, real policy analysts, just citizens of the United States are, are thinking more about Latin America than they have at any time in recent history. So that's why we're debating this topic. We could be debating a different topic. This is the one we got. I think it's pretty good. The question number two is, why is this the Latin America topic? So that was what the topic paper was called. But this topic paper suggested a, a variety of different resolutions, not all of which were just Cuba, Mexico, and Venezuela. We're going to talk about that next. When somebody asks you what the topic this year is, most of you are going to say Latin America. I think it's really the economic engagement topic, or it's the Cuba, Mexico, Venezuela topic. So I got my Cuba shirt on today. Awesome shirt. But the, we're going to call it the Latin America topic, so I think it's important that you know about Latin America. And certainly discussions of Latin America will be prominent on the topic. It is much harder than you would think to define Latin America, and it is much more problematic than I thought. So Wikipedia says Latin America is a region of the Americas where Romance languages, i.e. those derived from Latin, particularly Spanish and Portuguese, and variably French, are primarily spoken. So unpacking that, it's the part of the Americas where Spain and Portugal uh, colonize, and where the Spanish and Portuguese language are spoken, and arguably French, although that is very arguably. Black's Law Dictionary, so I look for like a dictionary definition, says Western Hemisphere designated member countries slash areas where mainly Spanish or Portuguese is spoken. These include Mexico, Central America, except Belize, and South America, except French Guiana, Guiana, and Suriname. Boy, that's weirdly precise, right? If you look at a map, French Guiana, Guiana, and Suriname are all right there near Venezuela. Why don't they count? 
of the Belize town? Well, it's because they speak not Spanish and not Portuguese. Suriname is the only country in Latin America that doesn't border a country that speaks Spanish or Portuguese, which is kind of a cool fact about Suriname. But that was just a cool fact about Suriname. The reason they're not included under the Black's Law Dictionary is because they are not Spanish or Portuguese. So they, Black's Law doesn't count French. There's a lot of debate about which countries are included. The common list is the following countries. You don't have to write this down, but just think about how many of these you like knew were a country and how many you know something about. Argentina, Bolivia, Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica, Cuba, the Dominican Republic, Ecuador, El Salvador, and then French Guiana, arguably, Guadalupe, Guatemala, Haiti, Honduras, Martinique, Mexico, Nicaragua, Panama, Paraguay, Peru, Puerto Rico, St. Bartholomew, St. Martin, Uruguay, and Venezuela. And a lot of those are French, and so they wouldn't be included under certain definition. A lot of those are French territory. The term Latin America was not used until the 1850s, and it did not become prominent until the mid-1900s, so not that long ago, 60 years-ish. Before that, Latin America just didn't exist. That doesn't mean that the area, the country, the people, all of that didn't exist. It just means that that concept, the idea that there's a region of the world called Latin America, did not exist. And as a result of the etymology and the, his, the kind of just historical baggage that goes along with the phrase Latin America, the term Latin America, it is very contestable and very critiquable. I got a couple of uh, cards. So person named Thomas Holloway, who's a professor of Latin American history at UC Davis, uh, wrote an essay called Latin America, What's in a Name? And he says, by its historical and intellectual origins, the term Latin America privileges those groups who descend from Latin peoples, Spain and Portugal, but not, ironically enough, the French-speaking populations of Canada or the Caribbean. Latin America as a term ignores or claims dominance over other cultures in the region which have recently come to reassert their distinctive traditions, including a plethora of languages spoken by tens of millions of indigenous people, none of which have any relationship to Spanish or Portuguese or Latin. The current condition of peoples of indigenous and African heritage has a historical relationship to conquest, colonialism, subjugation, forced assimilation, exploitation, marginalization, and exclusion. Those are not processes to celebrate and use as the basis for national or regional identity. He is not a fan of the topic of what I just wrote here. And that makes sense to me. It's not Latin America. Spain and Portugal do not own that territory. We should not define the history of this region of the world entirely because Spain and Portugal were the first two countries to colonize and kill a lot of people and enslave a lot of people. That's stupid. I'm still going to use the term Latin America, and I think it's inevitable that you all will too, but I think you need to think about what that means, and I think you need to think critically about what that means, and what assumptions you are making about that part of the world when you use that language. And in particular, when you think about, you know, how do Latin Americans think about U.S. policy? What do Latin Americans think about this or that? That's just a made-up concept. One more card from uh, Walter Mignolo, who wrote a book that's awesome called The Idea of Latin America. <clears throat> this will blow some of your minds, I think. I find it interesting. He says, an excess of confidence has spread all over the world regarding the ontology of continental divides. While it could be debated whether there are four, six, or seven continents, it is unquestionable that the count of six or seven includes the basic four-way subdivision of Asia, Africa, America, and Europe. That undisputed division underlies not only debates over continental divides, but also ideas of east and west, north and south, and explicitly hierarchical categories such as first, second, third, and fourth worlds. The wide acceptance of those geographical designations hides the fact that the division of continents and the geopolitical structures imposed upon them are all imperial constructions of the past 500 years. A god did not create the planet Earth and divide it from the very beginning into four continents. The narrative and argument of this book will be about how the idea of Latin America came about. One of the main goals is to uncouple the name of the subcontinent from the cartographic image we all have of it. It is an excavation of the imperi imperial colonial foundation of the idea of Latin America that will help us unravel the geopolitics of knowledge from the perspective of coloniality. 
The Americas exist today only as a consequence of European colonial expansion and the narrative of that expansion from the European perspective. There's a lot of big words in there, some of you didn't understand some of the specific words, and you'll learn some of that when you learn uh, to read kind of critical literature. But the, the basic idea is that our whole conception of continental divisions, America, Latin America, that's all a product of European colonialism, and that's just true. The Incas, the Mayans, they never lived in Latin America. They lived in what we now call Latin America, but they did not live in Latin America. They were not Latin Americans. And the indigenous people and the people of African heritage and the people of Asian heritage that live in the place that we call Latin America have nothing to do with Spain or Portugal or Latin. So I encourage you, as you think about this topic, to think critically. Those of you that are interested in critical arguments, I think this question gives you a springboard on which to develop some of those arguments. Number three, <clears throat> why these countries? Why Cuba, Mexico, and Venezuela? Great question. To be honest, I sort of disagree with the inclusion of the three. I'll explain that in a minute. But the preview is that Cuba and Venezuela go together, and Mexico does not. There were nine countries discussed in the topic paper. Only three made the cut. The nine were Argentina, Bolivia, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Cuba, Ecuador, Mexico, and Venezuela. Cuba is the most visible example of controversial U.S. policy in Latin America. We have an embargo on Cuba. You're going to learn a ton about that in the Cuba lecture that uh, Mr. Repco will be doing tomorrow. Mexico is America's closest ally in Latin America, and it's one of the United States' biggest trading partners. We work together on border security, on immigration, on drug trafficking, on trade. We have NAFTA. You're going to learn a lot about that in a few minutes from Mr. Feldman. It's going to be very interesting. Mexico is a fascinating country. I think my favorite is Venezuela, which is like in between. They're an adversary in many ways, but they're also an ally in many ways, and it's very confusing, and it's a fascinating, fascinating country with interesting politics and in interesting history. And the recent offer of asylum to Edward Snowden makes it all the more interesting. We get a ton of oil from Venezuela. We have Venezuela says that we're the devil. It's fascinating. It really is fascinating. I'm kind of obsessed with Venezuela. I follow Nicolas Maduro on Twitter. It's awesome. I don't. I forget who's doing the Venezuela. Oh, Carly, Carly Wonderlake. Now Carly Watson is doing the Venezuela lecture. That's going to be awesome. I would be. You know, I, I might come just to watch that. It's, it's great. So, what are the similarities between these three countries? Well, all three are in Latin America. All three were at one time, <coughs> excuse me, Spanish colonies. All three overwhelmingly speak Spanish. All three are overwhelmingly Catholic, Roman Catholic. Pope from Latin America. Follow him on Twitter, too. Tweets once a day. It's great. It's good stuff. I mean, even if you're not Catholic, <clears throat> I think it's interesting. You're like, it's good stuff. Same way I would follow the Dalai Lama on Twitter or, you know, anyone else on Twitter. I don't think the Dalai Lama has Twitter. I'm just saying, like, if the Dalai Lama had Twitter, I would follow it. So follow the Pope. It's one tweet a day. What does he post? Like, I think it's just like... No, he like gives like a message every day, a real short message, just kind of a thought for the day. And most of it, he's a Jesuit, so I teach at Jesuit school. I sort of consider myself a Jesuit. Uh, it's all about service and being a person for others, and so a lot of his tweets are messages about the mission to serve, stuff like that. Yes. Uh, are you sure? I am not sure. He might. It was just an example. I apologize for the weird distraction. Uh, all three have strong national affinities for baseball, and I'm going to take a minute to talk about this just because I'm fascinated by baseball. I'm wearing a World Baseball Classic jersey. I have one for Cuba and one for Venezuela as well. Uh, 113 players from Mexico have played in the major leagues, 286 from Venezuela, and several hundred from Cuba, including about 70 who have defected from Cuba since the embargo. And I have two side notes about this. Uh, number one, tomorrow's All-Star Game features 22 Latin American players, which is a record, including Miguel Cabrera, who is probably going to win the MVP again, because he's awesome, and he plays for the Tigers, 
And he's from Venezuela. And he's a national hero in Venezuela. The Venezuelan embassy to the United States has a website. And they constantly are posting articles about Miguel Cabrera. He's the first player ever to hit 30 home runs and have 94 RBI by the all survey. If you don't know anything about baseball, who cares? But that's for those of you who care stuff about baseball. Uh, and some of you, even if you don't follow baseball, might know about this, this dude for the Dodgers, Yasiel Puig. He's from Cuba. He's going to play an all-star game even though he's only been in the major leagues for a month, which is crazy, but awesome. Opening day this year, foreign-born players, and almost all of them are from Latin America. There's a few from Japan and Korea, Canada, um, Netherlands, because Curacao counts as Netherlands, but it's in Latin America. It's right by Venezuela. Most of them are from Latin America. Over 28% of opening day rosters were foreign-born players. And this year, on opening day, there were 63 players from Venezuela. 63, imagine that. That's second only to the Dominican Republic in non-American, non-United States ballplayers. 15 players from Cuba, which is crazy because we have an embargo on Cuba. They've left their country to come play here. They can't go back for 10 years. They're not welcome in their country anymore. 15 of those, and 14 from Mexico. So that's side note number one about baseball. Side note number two about baseball. There is a fascinating article, and I would encourage you to read this even if you're not that into baseball, in the New York Daily News that I saw yesterday about a Latin American all-star game that was held in New York City 50 years ago, in, or 60 years ago, in October of 1953. And it was the last game that was ever played at the Polo Grounds, which is a really famous stadium in New York. And it was the first and only time baseball's Latin players would be squarely in the spotlight, is a quote from the article. And the game featured players from all three topic countries, as well as three others. So there were players from Cuba, Puerto Rico, the Dominican Republic, Venezuela, Panama, and Mexico. And there were four Hall of Famers who played in the game. Roberto Clemente, Orlando Cepeda from Puerto Rico, Juan Marichal from the Dominican, and Luis Aparicio from Venezuela. He was the first ever Hall of Famer from Venezuela. And if you want to check that out, it's on the New York Daily News. If you just search for any of those words, you'll, you'll pull it up. It's great. I don't know how they dug that up. I, don't, I think most people didn't remember it, uh, but that's pretty cool. I really like baseball, and that's one way that I'm connected with the topic. There are other ways to connect to the topic. Art, music, food. There's a lot of really cool things about Latin America, and there's a lot of things that we in the United States have as a result of our relationship with Latin America that we probably didn't even think about. All right, back to the list. All three countries have very high literacy rates, 91, 93, and 99%. That's uh, Venezuela, Mexico, Cuba. Cuba has a 99 point something percent literacy rate, highest in the world. <coughs> US is, uh, I don't actually know what the US is up to. I looked it up when I did the notes for this, but now I forgot. All right, you help me out? All right, how much time I got left? I got 20 minutes left? All right, awesome. <laughs> All three countries have abundant oil resources, which is important. All three have left-leaning governments, or relatively left-leaning governments, but they're kind of different. And all three have a history of revolutions. And all three have had relatively recent transitions in power. So in Cuba, Raul Castro took over in 2008 from his brother Fidel. In Mexico, President Nieto took over in 2012, which is last year. And in Venezuela, Nicolas Maduro took over in April. So when we started at Georgetown, he had only been in office for a couple months. Now it's been a little longer. We're learning more about it. But there are big differences. Mexico is an ally. Cuba is not. Venezuela is uncertain. But more adversary, especially given the stone and stuff. Mexico and Venezuela are federal republics, so they are democracies. Cuba is a communist country. Mexico is one of the U.S.'s largest trading partners. It's third. Venezuela is 14th. So that's big for an adversary. And the U.S. doesn't trade that much with Cuba because of the embargo. And you're going to learn a ton more about all three of these countries. I have two suggestions for how to approach those lectures. So just a way to think about these lectures. Number one, use the big questions that we're asking to think about the stuff that you're learning about each country. And in particular, think about the similarities and the differences and how history affects them. Number two is specifically, think critically about the history of each country. So it's impossible to do a topic lecture 
uh, one of these country lectures without talking a lot about history. And some of these students will be like, oh, it's boring. It's like history class, not learning it, not interested. Just wait till they tell me what the DA is, tell me what the advantage is. But I encourage you to avoid that instinct because the history of these nations, the colonial history, the pre-colonial history, and then the history since they each gained independence and have had relations with the United States, that history largely shapes this year's topic. And so if you know stuff about the history of these nations and their relationship with the United States, you are much better equipped to debate the policies and to debate the proposals that are now being made and how to interact with them. You're much better equipped to debate the politics of the issue. If you don't understand the history of Cuba, it's impossible for you to understand why there is so much resistance to changing the embargo. If you don't understand the colonial history of Venezuela or the colonial history of Mexico, it's hard for you to understand kind of how those relationships have developed and why Venezuela is kind of an adversary, why Mexico, who we fought two wars against, is an ally. You just you need to know the history. It's not boring unless you don't understand how relevant it is. Big question number four. What is engagement and what is it not? You have an excellent topicality file that Casey Harrigan, who, who was the person who was here, uh, who introduced this morning, um, researched. It has a lot of great cards in it. Engagement is usually defined not by what it is, by what, but by what it is not. It's usually described as not containment, not isolation, not punishment, not military pressure, not appeasement, not a bunch of other things. And so it can be hard to define. One of the cards from the Top County file, there's several, from this person uh, named Evan Resnick, who is a professor, assistant professor of political science, and he wrote an article called Defining Engagement. And he says, while the term engagement enjoys great consistency and clarity of meaning in the discourse of romantic love, it enjoys neither in the discourse of statecraft. So that's supposed to be funny. Being really funny. You, know, you, know what, you know what it means when someone's like, I just got engaged but you have a hard time understanding when you're like, what does it mean to engage Cuba? <laughs> Quality of debate is diminished by the persistent inability of the US foreign policy establishment to advance a coherent and analytically rigorous conceptualization of engagement. Scholars have not fared better than policymakers in the effort to conceptualize engagement because they often make at least one of the following critical errors. Number one, treating engagement as a synonym for appeasement. We'll talk about that in a second. Number two, defining engagement so expansively that it essentially constitutes any policy relying on positive sanctions, so very broad definition that doesn't really mean anything, or number three, defining engagement in an unnecessarily restrictive manner. So he's like, I heard the tea debate, it's bad. That's basically what he's saying. It's hard to define, people disagree, they make mistakes in how to define engagement. He says, I propose that we define engagement as the attempt to influence the political behavior of a target state through the comprehensive establishment and enhancement of contacts with that state across multiple issue areas. Or, to put it much more simply, we should engage them, not contain them. We should try to use contacts and closer relations to change their behavior, not coerce them into changing their behavior. And so that's why it is a fundamentally different way to approach a nation whose behavior you want to change than containment. It doesn't just give them whatever they want. That's appeasement. It tries to get them to change their behavior. So we want Cuba to, to be more democratic. We want Cuba to stop imprisoning political protesters. We want Venezuela to crack down on financing of terrorism or of money laundering. We want Mexico to better enforce the border. We want a change in the target nation's behavior. The question is how to get there. Engagement is one strategy. And the engagement strategy is the kind of positive one. It's to try to convince you to change your behavior by offering things, not by punishing you. So I've used a strategy of engagement to try to get you to pay attention to today's lecture. I tried to give you some idea about why you're learning this and try to tell you that it was going to be good for you, that you were going to learn some stuff that would be a little interesting. You know, I, I, I was willing to admit that you might get bored at some point, so I hope hopefully that concession kind of got you to trust me a little bit more. But my goal in that engagement was to try to get you to pay closer attention than you would have otherwise. So I utilized engagement during this lecture. I didn't tell you if you don't pay attention, you're banned from camp. Or if you didn't pay attention, work duty. 
That's a different strategy. And the engagement strategy that we're talking about in the resolution is the same idea applied to statecraft, applied to US foreign policy towards Cuba, Mexico, and Venezuela. Number five. The resolution doesn't just say engagement, it says economic engagement. And that's meaningful. That word economic matters. So engagement is any relationship, any contact, any interaction that attempts to change the target nation's behavior that relies on positive things, not negative things, not coercion, not threats. Economic engagement is a subset of engagement, and it can be hard to figure out what limit that places on the topic. The best definition of economic engagement comes from uh, Miles Collar and Scott Kastner, and they are professors at UC San Diego. You'll find that when you do the research, a lot of the best Latin American stuff is in California, not surprisingly. <coughs> and I guess Kastner's from Maryland. He's the co-author. I think Collar is like kind of a big dude on economic engagement. He says, economic engagement is a policy of deliberately expanding economic ties with an adversary in order to change the behavior of the target state and improve bilateral political relations. Like super simple, straightforward, that, that makes a ton of sense to me. So, deliberately expanding economic ties, that's the first part, with an adversary, and that's why it's a little weird that Mexico's in the top of it. They're not an adversary in order to change the behavior of that nation and to improve relations with that nation. So the mechanism is deepening economic connections, deepening economic ties, and the goal is to change behavior and facilitate closer relations. And Colin Castor suggests there are two types. They say, scholars have usefully distinguished between two types of economic engagement conditional policies, write this down, that require an explicit quid pro quo on the part of the target country, and policies that are unconditional. So conditional policies, quid pro quo, unconditional policies. Conditional policies are the inverse of economic sanctions. Instead of threatening a target country with economic loss in the absence of policy change, conditional engagement promises Increased economic benefit in return for desired policy change. So if you change, we'll give you something good. If you pay attention, you get candy. If you pay attention, you get to sleep in tomorrow. If you pay attention, you get more fun time. Not if you don't pay attention, work duty. Does that make sense? Quid pro quo, this for that. Unconditional engagement strategies are more passive than conditional variants in that they do not include a specific quid pro quo, a specific this for that. Rather, countries deploy economic links with an adversary in the hopes that economic interdependence itself will, over time, change the target's foreign policy behavior and yield a reduced threat of conflict. So if I'm trying to get one of you to change your behavior, offer you something if you change your behavior, or I can just give you the thing I was going to offer you and hope that because I gave you that thing, you're going to change your behavior as a result. So if I proactively said, you know, this afternoon we're going to cancel a little bit of lab time and you all go play frisbee or you can go sit outside or you can get a, you know, go to the dairy store. Yeah, if you don't know about the dairy store, it's awesome. Uh, so good. You, I might think that by, by giving you that, by making that Offer to you by engaging you in that way that you will change, that you will change. You'll, you'll adapt your behavior. You'll pay closer attention because you know you can trust me. I'm a reliable partner. I've given you something that you want. By giving you that, you know, you can maybe pay closer attention this morning because you know you're not going to have to pay as close attention this afternoon. Economic engagement can be distinguished from a bunch of other kinds of engagement. Some of the other kinds of engagement that you might hear about, that you're going to have to figure out what they mean. Political engagement. How's political engagement different than economic engagement? Diplomatic engagement. How is that different than economic engagement? Military engagement. How is that different than economic engagement? 
cultural engagement. How is that different? Or civil society engagement. There are a lot of adjectives that people use before the word engagement. One is economic, but there are a bunch of other ones. And it is an open debate what differentiates economic from all of those others, or whether it is even possible to distinguish economic from political and draw a line between the two, or economic from diplomatic. Most economic engagement requires some element of diplomacy. It has some political effect. Can we distinguish economic from military? Can we distinguish economic from cultural? Can we distinguish economic from civil society? That's what you will be debating when you debate topicality on this topic. That is the big topicality controversy. But the most important lesson is there are two kinds of engagement, conditional, which is quid pro quo, and unconditional, which is not. On Tuesday, so that's tomorrow, All-Star Game Day. All-Star Game Day night, you will get a topicality seminar in your lab. And most of those topicality seminars will go into more depth about some of these topicality issues, about the specifics of this. So look forward to that. I would encourage you in advance of that to read through the topicality file, read through the important cards, skim it, get a sense of what cards are in there, read some of the good ones, read some of the ones that are in the, you know, the one C's or the front lines. But for now, we're going to have to cut that off for time reasons. The important thing is, you've got to know what engagement is, and you've got to know what economic engagement is, and that will shape most of your topicality debates. There will also be debates about toward. Those are beyond the scope of this lecture. All right, lessons so far. So on the left there, that's David Munoz, who's in my lab, who's at this camp from Damien. And that's Nancy Pelosi. So Obama gave a speech at Georgetown about climate change while we were at Georgetown. And we got one student up, has to go, and David Munoz got to go. And he's got some close-up photos of President Obama giving a speech, like far, like closer, you all are closer, farther away from me, he was from Obama. He had to meet Nancy Pelosi and a bunch of other people. And then on the right there is a demonstration debate at Georgetown uh, featuring left to right Anastasia from Bronx, that's Andrew Arsh, who you can't really see, Andrew Markoff, and Elsa Given from College Prep. Some of you might know those people. Whatever, just photos. Uh, so I spent three weeks there, and I think I learned five things that are the most important things. I'm just going to briefly tell you what they are so that you can pay closer attention to these concepts and you can be thinking about this stuff as we go forward. Number one is that students don't know very much about Latin America. Which is, I mean, it's not your fault. It just seems like American schools do not prioritize teaching you about Latin America. Some of you know more than others, depending on your geography. So the kids from Florida know a ton more than the kids from Michigan or from Wisconsin, or from Minnesota, or whatever. Kids from California, I think, know a lot about Mexico. But most of you don't know that much. And so it's really important for you to not assume that it doesn't matter that you don't know, but to take the time to really learn about Latin America, the geography, the history, the culture. You know, know important leaders. Know the different countries and what, why they are important and what their relationship is like with the United States and with the other countries. I have taken it upon myself. Like I didn't know that much about Latin America either. I've tried to learn about a lot of the non-topic countries too. So I've learned a lot about Bolivia. Bolivia is fascinating because uh, Bolivia is the first country to pass legislation in the world that defines uh, human rights as applying to nature, as applying to non-human life. It's considered uh, kind of like uh, model legislation for other countries. So if you're in Bolivia, you can sue a company for hurting the environment as a violation of human rights. And they're the first country that's done that. There's a bunch of other cool stuff, like Suriname, the only country that doesn't border uh, Spanish or Portuguese speaking uh, country. A lot of fascinating stuff in Latin America. Take the opportunity to learn that. You know, clean up after your school districts and clean up after your the people who set your curriculum. And you know, they didn't do a good job of teaching you about Latin America, so you got to take that upon yourself. Number two is that economic engagement is relatively easy to define, but it is very difficult to limit. So it's not hard to find definitions of economic engagement. But it is very difficult to decide what counts as that and what does not. So matching up plans to definitions is harder than I thought it would be. Number three is that quid pro quo, or QPQ, is super important on this topic. It is way more important than I thought it would be when I went to Georgetown. 
both substantively in terms of arguments about foreign policy and what the United States should do, and theoretically, because it opens up a whole host of arguments about counter plans and about plans, and about disadvantages. You know, whenever the opportunity arises, learn more about quid pro quo, learn more about conditional engagement, learn more about the substance of that and the theory of that. It's really important. Number four is that oil is really important. All three topic countries have oil. And a lot of competition in Latin America is for oil. Your opening packet affirmative discusses Cuban oil, offshore oil resources. So you're going to have a lot of debates about that. You're going to have some debates about the Saudi Arabia oil disag. That stuff's really important. And it's not just important with Cuba. It's important with Venezuela. It's like the issue with Venezuela. And it's also important with Mexico. So just in the first three weeks, our lab has written affirmatives about all three countries that have to do with oil. And so mastering oil, like understanding the economics of oil, the geopolitics of oil, just understanding how the oil market works and oil prices and all that stuff, like getting some background in oil, very important, more important than I thought it would be. And number five, and the thing that I will conclude on, is that this topic is much more timely and interesting than I thought it would be. I liked this topic from the beginning. I was a little annoyed that Mexico was in the topic because it does complicate things a little bit because your strategies against Cuba and Venezuela will be different than your strategies against Mexico on both the affirmative and the negative. But Latin America is fascinating and it's something that I didn't know very much about and it's been in the news a lot and I have loved following the developments in Venezuela and I love following the developments in Cuba. This episode about Edward Snowden and the Bolivian president Evo Morales' plane being grounded and the, the diplomatic fallout, it's fascinating. I think if you give it a chance, this can be a topic that really sparks your interest. You know, find something that connects you to the topic. For some of you, it'll be baseball. For some of you, it'll be uh, a personal connection from your region. You know, if you're in here from Florida, you might have a personal connection to the politics of Cuba. If you're from uh, you know, California or you're from Texas, you, know, you might have a personal connection to Mexico. You might connect to the music or the culture or the food uh, of, one of the one of the topic countries or of the region. But I want you to try to find where, what about this topic you can latch on to uh, and what can get you excited. And then learn about that and use that as a platform to learn more about Latin America. Because you know, I thought this was going to be a good topic. And then a lot of stuff happened in the last few weeks that has made it an even better topic. So you all are very blessed and you are very lucky that this is the topic you get to debate this year. And sometimes we have good topics, sometimes we have bad topics. I think this is a good one. And I think that this one is going to be really fun. Uh, and I think that the next four weeks or three weeks or two weeks or however long you are here at Michigan State are going to be awesome. Uh, yeah. Thank you for making the choice to come here. I think that you're going you're gonna to think that it was, it was the right choice. So good luck uh, and have fun. Learn something. Latin America. Good luck.